Good morning. Hope everyone is doing well today. Wanted to make a little video running through the first PowerPoint for fabric. It is a long one, so let's just hop right in here. So first thing we're looking at here, if you're following along in the slideshow, uh, in the slideshow, classifications of aircraft fabric. So our two main classifications here are synthetic or man-made and organic. For synthetic fabric, we're looking at glass fabric, fiberglass, you've probably heard of that before, and Dacron, which is a polyester fabric. Those are our two big synthetics. Uh, du Dacron is a DuPont trade name for filaments used in polyester. It is a polyester fabric. And uh, in the organic category, we have cotton and Irish linen. Irish linen is suitable for certificated aircraft if it complies with the requirements of TSO C-15. And we're going to talk about TSO C-15 here a little bit later, but it has to meet that TSO. Aircraft linen usually meets the British Specification 7F1. It is considered to be the equivalent of TSO C-15, which has uh, updated or been revised to TSO C-15D Delta. Among the cotton fabrics, so these are the uh, organic fabrics, we have our three primary classifications, and the first two are the ones we really need to know. Grade A and intermediate, which is going to be a little bit weaker than grade A, and glider cloth, which is kind of in its own category. It is specifically for gliders. There's some information on cotton there for you. Uh, you can learn a little bit more of that. I'm not going to take too much time on it. Egyptian cotton is considered one of the highest qualities, and it talks about its staple length that determines its, basically, its quality as a cotton. So on uh, grade A fabric, grade A fabric must meet TSO C15D or AMS standard 3806D. Now, <clears throat> fabric that meets this TSO will be identified with the manufacturer's name or trademark and either the AMS 3806 or the TSO C15 Delta or both along the selvage edge. Polyester fabric is now included in TSO 15 or C15D2, right? Again, this is the um, this is the TSO for grade A fabric. On this next slide, I'm looking at 38. You can kind of see some of the specifications for cotton from TSO C15D. Weight per square yard, 36 to 42 inches of width is about four, D, or four ounces. 60 inches of width is over four and a half ounces. TSO C15D fabric must have 80 to 84 threads per inch, both warp and fill. And the important thing that we're really going to have to remember, new grade A fabric must have a minimum tensile strength of 80 pounds per inch. So for grade A, we need a minimum of 80 pounds per square inch uh, tensile strength. Aircraft that use grade A fabric. Any aircraft that has wing loadings um, greater than 9 pounds a square foot or a VNE speed of 160 mi uh, miles per hour or greater is going to require grade A cloth. Do we remember what VNE is? It is our never exceed speed. So you can see that the type of fabric covering required for an aircraft is going to depend on its wing loading and its VNE speed. The condition of fabric covering must be determined every 100 hour in annual inspection because the strength of the fabric is a definite factor in the airworthiness of an airplane. Obviously, if fabric is covering our lift creation surfaces, the strength of that fabric is going to play heavily into the overall airworthiness of the aircraft. Fabric is considered to be airworthy until it deteriorates to a breaking strength less than 70% of the aircraft's, 70% uh, of the new strength of fabric required for that aircraft. So for grade A, the minimum deteriorated tensile strength for a fabric on an aircraft that originally required grade A is 56 pounds per square inch. 
So grade A fabric has a minimum tensile strength of 56 pounds per square inch. If you do the math, you'll find that 70% uh, of our original strength, what did we say our original strength was? 80? 70% of our original strength is 56 for grade A fabric. This means that the fabric may be allowed to deteriorate 30% of the original tensile strength. The minimum allowable tensile strength is 70% of the original. New grade A fabric must meet 80 pounds per inch. 70% of that is 56 pounds per inch. Intermediate fabric, so this was our next slightly less strong category. It is covered by TSOC 14B and AMS 3804. So look for those fours and you're gonna think intermediate fabric. Minimum tensile strength for new TSOC 14B or intermediate fabric is 65 pounds per inch. So knowing what we know about grade A, what do you think the minimum tensile strength is going to be for intermediate fabric if the minimum tensile strength for new is 65 pounds per inch? Well, have to do some math. Intermediate fabric is required uh, on aircraft with wing loading less than nine pounds per square foot. Given that the placarded never exceed speed is less than 160 miles per hour. So if we had wing loading under nine pounds per square foot, but our VNE speed is over 160 miles an hour, we're not gonna use intermediate, we're gonna to have to go up to grade A. Again, what determines what type of fabric is gonna be used, intermediate or grade A? It's gonna be wing loading and the never exceed speed or VNE speed, that is an FAA test question. If, excuse me, so we were talking about the minimum uh, tensile strength for deteriorate intermediate fabric, right? We said 70% of the new fabric strength. So 70% uh, of the original 65 pounds per inch is 46 pounds per inch. That is the minimum tensile strength for intermediate fabric. If grade A cotton is to be used on an aircraft that requires only intermediate fabric, right? So our aircraft has a VNE speed of less than 160, a wing loading of less than nine pounds per square foot. We can use intermediate or we can upgrade to grade A. If we choose to upgrade to grade A when it's not required for the aircraft, that grade A can deteriorate to 46 pounds per inch. Again, that was the minimum strength for intermediate fabric, right? So if we replace the intermediate with grade A, we can still allow it to degrade until it meets the minimum strength of intermediate, which was what was approved for that aircraft. TSOC 14 lays out some requirements for intermediate fabric. Uh, maximum weight per square yard is four ounces and its thread count may vary from 80 to 94 threads per inch. Well, now we go ahead and we see intermediate, uh, intermediate cotton fabric is no longer commonly available. Its only value is used as a reference material to determine the minimum strength to which fabric can be allowed to deteriorate before replacement. So we can't even really get intermediate fabric anymore. So typically what we're going to have to do is go up to grade A. So the wing loading and the never exceed speed are going to basically just dictate how much strength deterioration we can accept before that has to be replaced. So if the aircraft originally had intermediate fabric, we can let uh, the grade A fabric that we replace it with deteriorate down to the minimum for intermediate, which is 46 pounds per square foot. Glider cloth is covered by AMS 3802, 50 pounds per inch minimum new tensile strength and 35 pounds per inch deteriorated. Again, we don't talk about this one as much it is um, a glider thing, so we don't cover it as much. It's for use with gliders under eight pounds per square foot wing loading and a never exceed speed of below 135 miles per hour, 110 threads per inch maximum. So those are our organics, those cottons. For our inorganics or our synthetics, we're gonna talk about two types polyesters, which is a Dacron trade name, 
uh, Stitz Polyfiber, Seekonite, and Superflight. This is what we're going to be using to cover our aircraft uh, fabric practical uh, wings. And we have fiberglass, which is common trade name is Razorback. So we got poly uh, polyester and fiberglass is our two main inorganic or synthetic fabrics. When we're covering when we're covering an aircraft, be sure to use the same type and strength of fabric that was used originally by the aircraft manufacturer. That is what we're going off. If someone covered it with the incorrect fabric before, that doesn't mean we can go ahead and do that again just because that's what they had done. <clears throat> if we decide we want to convert uh, to a synthetic from an organic, so say we want to go from cotton to uh, razorback, for instance, that is considered a major alteration. And if we have a major alteration, of course, we're going to need a FAA Form 337 to be filled out for that major alteration. Stitz Polyfiber and Seekonite and Superflight. These are trade names of uh, polyester type synthetic fabrics. There are several different weights. 3.7, 3.5, 3.16, and 2.8 to 2.7 ounces per square yard. The important thing when we're installing these is that we do not deviate from the STC installation manual. Hopefully you guys know that by now. If we're going to write up a 337, we have to follow that STC's information because that is the approved data we're going to use to get that accepted. Razorback. This is the fiberglass. 3.6 ounces per square yard. And the great thing about Razorback is it's impervious to moisture, heat, mildew, chemicals, acids, and most importantly, sunlight. We're going to see that sunlight can wreak havoc on fabric coverings. UV rays are rough on fabrics. It requires an STC to install if not originally installed. So if I have an aircraft that came with uh, organic fabric, I'm going to have to get a, an STC in order to install a synthetic fabric. The other great thing about Razorback is by the authority of the FAA, we don't ever have to pull or punch test the fabric. All we have to do is do a visual inspection. But the downside of that, obviously, Razorback costs twice as much of the Dacron and the polyesters. And we're going to talk about punch tests. Typically, you're going to have to punch a hole in the fabric to test its strength and then uh, patch that hole. That's the really only effective way to test the strength of the fabric. Here are some glossary terms. Calendaring, nap, mercerization, warp. We've talked about warp before. That's the uh, threads that run the length of the fabric. The weft, woof, or fill. Those are 90 degrees to the warp threads. And here are some slides that kind of explain that for you and how that lays out. I'm not gonna go through those in great detail. Our selvage edge is the naturally bound edge of a length of fabric. So that's our manufactured edge, right? If we think about rivets, we had the shop head and the manufactured head. Well, the selvage edge is the edge, is the edge of the fabric as it comes from the factory. Bias, a cut fold or seam made diagonally across the warp. So it's going to be like a 45 to the warp fibers. Uh, this is a bias cut. Bias cut fabrics, often used in surface tapes, we'll talk about though, allow the material to be stretched slightly for better conforming to structural contours. So we're going to use bias cut surface tapes when we're going over uh, wing tips or any contoured uh, sharp contoured area where we have to go around bends. This bias cut is more flexible that way and it stretches better around um, bends. So now we're going to talk about the different type of tapes and the different uh, components that we're going to use to complete a covering project. So we have our surface tape and finishing tape. It's going to be made of the same material as the fabric covering for that aircraft. We're not going to mix and match. Surface tape or finishing, finishing tape is used all over the, every seam, over rib lacing, 
around all corners and along leading edges and around the tips and along the trailing edges of the surface. So this surface tape kind of covers the seams that we have left over after we cover whatever it is. And we'll talk about the envelope method. Regardless of what method we use, we're going to have surface or finishing tape over those seams. A lot of times, as I said before, we're going to use bias cut. It's cut to a 45 degree angle of uh, to the warp thread. This allows it to cover contours better than um, a straight 90 to the uh, 90 to the warp or the weft threads. Reinforcing tape is a special product that has much larger warp, larger warp thread than fill thread. We're going to use reinforcing tape over the fabric and under the rib stitching to reinforce the fabric to prevent the lacing cord from cutting or wearing through the fabric. So once we lay our fabric down, we're going to put the reinforcing tape over our wing ribs, over the fabric covering our wing ribs before we do our rib stitching. This is going to help reinforce that fabric and keep that uh, lacing cord from the rib stitching from cutting and wearing through the fabric. Here on slide 79, we can kind of see an example of those white stripes. That's the reinforcing tape over our ribs, and those black lines are our rib stitches. We want our reinforcing tape to be the width of the rib cap strip. That's that top flat portion of the rib. And we can get it made in Dacron cotton linen. We want to use the same material that we used for the covering. Reinforcing tape needs to have a minimum tensile strength of 150 pounds per half inch. Here on slide 84, you can kind of see a wing. Here's the internal structure. You can see the front, uh, front spar. Over those wing ribs is where we're going to do our uh, inner rib bracing. That rib stitch cord is used to uh, hold that fabric to the structure. Used to sew or attach the fabric to the wings at the wing ribs and it must have a tensile strength of 40 pounds single or 80 pounds double. Well, that makes sense. If we're gonna single or double spit stitch, we have to meet those guidelines. Lacing cord is typically waxed. I highly recommend the use of wax lacing cord it has several advantages the biggest one for me is it makes it easier to pull that cord through the fabric it repels moisture it reduces fraying of the cord and it's basically just beeswax infused into the cord <coughs> excuse me now when you that cord is waxed typically you're not going to want to exceed 20 percent of the weight of the finished cord so we don't want too much, much wax there and adding too much weight. Anti-tear strips. Anti-tear strips are used on aircraft with a never exceed speed in excess of 250 miles per hour. You are going to see this question again. And they're cut from the same material as the fabric used for covering. So these anti-tear strips you would cut yourself. Anti-tear strips go under the reinforcing tape on the upper surface of the wings under the reinforcing tape on the upper surfaces of the wings. It's used both on the upper and bottom surfaces of the wing in the propeller strip slipstream. And we're gonna see uh, a, a picture of that coming up a little later, right? The parts of the wing that are gonna be subjected to the propeller strip uh, slipstream have to have a little bit of extra reinforcement um, to help them uh, manage the extra forces applied to them by the propeller slipstream. So on slide 94 here we see the placement of the anti-tear strips. So our fabric goes on the wing first, then our anti-tear strips, then our reinforcing tape, then we do our rib stitching. Once we've rib stitched then we're going to cover our rib stitches with surface tape and here again on slide 94 you see our ribs we have our anti-tear strip in white 
We see our reinforcing tape. It's kind of that beige color. We see our rib stitching in black. And then over the top of that, we are going to apply our surface tape. Surface tape will cover that rib stitching. About the propeller slipstream, for our purposes, the slipstream is considered to be equal to the propeller diameter plus one extra rib on each side. So we're gonna look at the propeller diameter and how many ribs on each side of the aircraft, on each wing, wing it covers with its diameter. And we're gonna go one extra rib on uh, uh, with the reinforcing tape. So the diameter of the propeller plus one rib, those require that reinforcing tape. Here on slide 97, you see a great example. There's our aircraft. You can see the propeller diameter. It's uh, reaching over three ribs on each side. So we're gonna do four ribs on each side. Drain grommets. We're gonna dra install drain grommets on the underside of the wings. Okay, drain grommet, hmm, probably for drainage, right? Some, uh, here it says used for inspection as well. Drain grommets are typically used to drain moisture out of the inside of the wing. Drain grommets are doped directly to the underside of the surface wherever moisture may be trapped. One on each, one on each side of a rib for neutral dihedral wings. So if we have a neutral dihedral, right? Remember dihedral, right? And then a neutral dihedral, we're gonna have a drain grommet on each side of each rib. If we have a positive dihedral, we're going to have drain grommets on the outside of each rib. For negative dihedral, we're going to have the drain grommets on the inside of each rib. Hopefully that makes sense. Here on slide 100, here is our wing. And you can see we have drain grommets installed on the outside trailing edge of each of those ribs. Here on slide 101, we have a horizontal stabilizer with negative dihedral. When we have that negative dihedral, we're gonna place those drain grommets on the inside corner of the ribs at the trailing edge, right? We want moisture to uh, collect in those areas and be able to drain out. Slide 103, here we have a neutral dihedral, and you can see we have drain grommets on each side. Slide 104 shows a couple of typical grommets. We're going to be using the one on the left, the plastic grommet. They have seaplane grommets as well. You can see they are covered towards the leading edge, only open towards the trailing edge. And then we have metal or brass grommets as well. And again, they serve the same purpose. Their job is to allow a place for moisture to get out. And some people say, well, isn't it gonna let moisture in? Yes, but this is the double-bladed sword we deal with. Moisture is gonna get the wing inside the wing regardless. So we need to put a place for it to drain out. <clears throat> Inspection rings are doped onto the fabric of the fuselage or the wing where it's necessary to examine fittings, internal braces, cables, and similar items inside the covered structure. These are just basically plastic rings, right? Any inspection areas we're gonna need access to, we're gonna install an inspection ring. When it comes time for inspection, we're gonna cut the center of that inspection ring out, do our inspection, and then apply a patch over that inspection ring. On slide 106, you can see an inspection ring installed on the top of a wing. This is the exact type that you are going to install in the practical. The green is Ecobond cement. That's what we use. We're doing the Seekonite. And you can see they've cut a pinked edge patch to go over it. Slide 108 shows our inspection ring with the patch over it, right? And that's ready to be finished with the rest of the wing. When we're applying fabric, seams 
are going to be inevitable. We want seams parallel to the line of flight or cord wise. They're, prefer they're preferable, right? And hopefully that makes sense. If my seam is 90 degrees to the direction of flight, those aerodynamic forces are going to be acting a lot uh, more trying to pull that fabric up. So ideally we want our seams in uh, parallel to our direction of flight. But spanwise seams are acceptable and there's some areas where you're not going to be able to avoid a spanwise seam. The two main things we're looking in for in our seams are strength, the ability to withstand strain, and elasticity. Durability and we want it to look good. Slide 113, we start going into our different types of machine sewn seams and the number of fabrics involved in each. And I'm going to run over these really quick. You can go back and kind of study these on your own, but we need to know how many layers of fabric are associated with each type of seam. So we have our French fell, which uses four layers of fabric, our folded fell, which uses three layers of fabric, and our plain overlap. The only time we can use a plain overlap is when we're using a pinked edge, which is cut uh, with pinking shears. It's that zigzag pattern, which gives us more surface area, more grab for our seam. That's the only time we can use plain overlap seams. Otherwise, we're going to have to use a French or a folded fell. Dimensions for machine sewed seams, machine sewed seams, 8 to 10 inches per inch. A sixteenth of an inch from each fold or edge, a quarter to three eighths between the two lines of stitches. One fifteen shows our French fell, and you can see how four layers of fabric are involved there, and there are dimensions. French fell, four layers thick. We need to know that. Slide one sixteen is our folded fell seam. You can see that it is three layers thick. It's very similar to the uh, French fell but we only have three layers of fabric. And then our plain overlap, pretty self-explanatory, just like our overlap uh, seams when we were doing sheet metal. There is only two layers there. Slide 118 is a plain overlap. You can see the zigzag peaked edges and the dimensions are there for you too. We really, the most thing we need to know about these seams is the number of fabric. Uh, layers that we're going to be going through. Eight to ten stitches per inch for machine sewn seams. Hand sewn seams are a little different. A plain overthrow stitch is acceptable but the baseball stitch is recommended. Right? Sometimes we're going to tear in the fabric, we're going to have to stitch the fabric back together. Minimum of four stitches per inch. Right? So for a machine sewn seam, it was 8 to 10 per inch. For hand sewn, it is 4 per inch. And we're going to lock our hand sewn seams every 10 inches. We're going to put in a lock stitch. We're going to use the modified same knot or a double half hitch for our lock stitch every 10 regular stitches on a, hand held, uh, uh, on a handmade seam. You're going to do some modified same knots for me. There are a couple different resources online you can go to look at that. It takes a little bit of practice, but once you get used to it, it's not so bad. Over those seams that we sew by hand, we're going to need surface tape. We already know this. Surface tape goes over all seams. For hand stitches, we're going to cover sewn spanwise seams on the leading edge with a minimum of 4 inch wide pink surface tape. And we're going to cover sewn spanwise trailing edge seams with a minimum of three inch surface tape. And we will all do this when we get into practical. Surface tape at the trailing edge. Do we need it or not? For aircraft with never exceed speeds in excess of 200 miles per hour, we need to cut V notches at least one inch in depth and a quarter inch in width in both edges 
of the surface tape when used to cover spanwise seams on trailing edges of the control surface. So this is an FAA test question. When do we need to notch our trailing edge surface tape? Well, that's when our VNE speed is in excess of 200 miles per hour. FAA test question. Dope seams can be used for aircraft with a VNE not greater than 150. So if our VNE is not 150 or greater, we can use um, a regular dope seam. <clears throat> for a lap or dope spanwise seam on metal or wood covered leading edges, lap the fabric at least four inches and cover with pinked surface edge tape at least four inches wide. So here we don't need to notch that trailing edge surface tape. When we go to do our coverings here on slide 134, wings may be covered with fabric by the envelope method, the blanket method, or a combination of both. We typically use the blanket method for our wings. Fuselages are covered either by the sleeve method or the blanket method. So what's the difference between the sleeve method and the blanket method? Typically, if you look at uh, slide 136, we're going to machine sew at least one of our seams. That kind of forms an envelope. We then slide the envelope onto the wing and complete the covering. Here, slide 137, you can see that I have that machine sewed edge, which makes it kind of like a slip. We slide that over the wing and then we continue our covering. The blanket method is when we're going to just wrap the structure and fabric and close the edges with adhesives or by hand sewing. We're going to use adhesive dope, that uh, Seekonite dope. So a blanket, you can look on slide 139, the blanket method, we're going to hand sew that rear seam. Or we can also use adhesive, which we'll do in our method. Both surfaces of fabric covering on wings and control surfaces must be securely fastened to the ribs by lacing cord or any other method originally approved by the aircraft. So we, obviously we have to attach that fabric to the wing structure. We're going to use uh, rib lacing cord, but there are some different methods. The method we're going to use is the rib stitch method. We're going to stitch the fabric onto the wing ribs on the top and bottom. Knowing how to space these rib stitches is important. Here's what we're going to go off. First, the spacing originally used by the manufacturer. If we can uh, find that information, we're going to follow that. If we can't find that manufacturer information, we're going to use the VNE speed of the aircraft and whether or not it's in the propeller slipstream. And remember, the slipstream is the prop diameter plus one rib on each side. In slide 145, we see on the bottom 100, 150, 200, that's our never exceed speed. On our vertical axis, we see one, two, three, four. That's the spacing between rib stitches in inches. So you can see we can use this chart, right? If I have a 200 mile an hour VNE speed, I follow that line up till I hit the slip spacing in slipstream, then I'm gonna follow that over. So for 200 an hour VNE in the slipstream, we're gonna do maybe around one and three quarter inch. For outside the slipstream, we're gonna go up, follow that 200. That's about two and a half inches between stitches. So this is how we determine the length between our stitches, which is gonna determine how many stitches we're going to use. The spacing between the starting stitch and the next stitch should be one half the normal stitch spacing. 
Where the stitching ends, such as at the rear spar, the last two stitches should be spaced one half the normal spacing as well. So at the beginning of the rib and the end of the rib, we're gonna double up. Here on slide 148, we see we're going to um, put the square knot on top of the surface and we're going to run that down. If you look at slide 149, you see a good example of these brown strips. That's our rib stitch. And you can see our spacing at the beginning and at the end of the rib is half of the normal. So we kind of double up there at the beginning at the end. Other methods that may have been used from the factory to connect the fabric to the wing, screws, fabric rivets, and metal clips. Some manufacturers would use a sheet metal screw with a washer. They would use that um, to hold that uh, fabric to the rib. Here on 153, we have a fabric rivet. And some of the older Cessnas used what they call the Cessna clip. They're these little metal clips, and they're used to hold the fabric, again, to the top of the wing rib, taking the place of stitching. If we have those, we don't have to do rib stitching. Here are Martin clips. You can see they have a little angle there. So once they're placed down into drilled holes in the ribs, that little notch on the Martin clip will hold that clip into the wing. It's very important that before we do the covering, we inspect the internal structure of the wing, obviously. We got to make sure that everything is good there before we cover it because inspection is obviously going to be much more difficult after we cover the aircraft. <clears throat> Slide 159, we go again to the strength criteria for aircraft fabric. The minimum performance standards for new intermediate grade fabric are specified in C14. Remember, intermediate grade C14. Remember four. Minimum performance standards for new grade A fabric are in C15D, which references that AMS 3806D. How often must we inspect fabric covering on an aircraft? Well, the condition of the fabric covering must be determined at every 100 hour and every annual inspection. If I'm just an aircraft owner, I only fly myself and my family around, I'm not for hire, do I require a 100 hour inspection? Does anybody remember? Do I require an animal or annual? Excuse me. Fabric is considered to be airworthy until it deteriorates to a breaking strength less than 70 percent of the strength of the new fabric originally required for that aircraft. So again, like I said before, if the fabric originally had intermediate, but we replace it with grade A, we can let that grade A deteriorate until it is at 70 percent of the original strength of intermediate fabric. Here, I'm skipping forward ahead to we'll slide 166. Talking about inspections. When storing aircraft uh, fabric covered aircraft, all openings large enough for rodents to enter should be taped. So mice will get into fabric covered aircraft when they're in storage. If you've ever stored any kind of machine, you'll know animals tend to give them some attention. Mice cause a couple of issues. One, they can chew through fabric, they can chew through rib stitching, and their urine is very corrosive. It can deteriorate fabric, it can deteriorate stitching. When we're doing inspections, it's good to know that typically the worst deterioration is going to occur on the top side of the wing. That is because it is exposed to UV rays much more than the bottom. Do you think we're going to want a light color or a dark color for our fabric to resist deterioration? Obviously, the darker the color, the faster UV rays are going to deteriorate it because the darker color 
absorbs more of those rays. Darker colors absorb more heat than lighter colors. So the warmer inner surface of the fabric under the dark color absorbs more moisture from the air inside the winger fuselage. When that surface cools, the moisture condenses and the fabric under the dark area becomes moist and promotes mildew growth in a localized area. So the color of the wing does make a pretty significant color. What if our aircraft has been replaced with fiberglass? But when we check cloth fabric that has been reinforced by applying fiberglass, we have to peel back that gloss cap, uh, the glass cloth in the area to be tested because we can only test the cloth. The test will be irrelevant if we test the cloth and the glass cloth that is over it. We're going to use fabric punch testers in order to determine the strength of the fabric. And you're going to see that fabric punch testers used to test fabric by pressing against or piercing the finished fabric are not FAA approved, but are an acceptable means and are to be used at the discretion of the mechanic. These are most often what's used in the field or in the hangar. You can get a special test apparatus for fabric that tries to pull the fabric apart, right? We're testing its stencil strength. Or you can send it out to a lab. But typically in the field, us mechanics are going to use a punch tester. If we're ever really close, right, we have marginal test results, we're really close to our lower threshold of tensile strength, we're going to have to do, one, send it out to be professionally tested, or two, we're going to just replace it. Fabric punch testers are quick. They don't require us cutting samples from the cloth, but they do have our downs their downsides in that they do damage the fabric. The two we're going to talk about are the mall and the say both testers. You will use both these testers when we get into practical time. Punch testers are not applicable to fiberglass coverings. Remember what we said before, fiberglass coverings don't require these tests. A visual test uh, is enough. Slide 175 is our mall tester. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this mall tester. We're going to press it against the fabric. There's a spring inside. As that spring compresses, you see along the main shaft of that uh, mall tester, it is graduated. It's going to read the strength. If I get up to my minimum required strength and I haven't punched through the fabric yet, I'm good to go. I'm not going to just keep pushing until I do break through the fabric. There are instances where people go to test the fabric and they push so hard that they put their entire hand and arm through the fabric surface, right? Don't be that guy. Use these with care. The mall tester is a little better. It does not necessarily punch a hole. It can make a depression, but if the fabric is up to its rated strength, it typically can hold up to a mall tester. The Sabo tester is a little different. If you look at slide 177, notice that it has a very sharp point. We are going to poke through the fabric with the Sabo tester. There's no way around it. So once we poke through, if the fabric meets its minimum tensile strength criteria, we're going to have to go back and patch that hole we made with the tester anyway. That's kind of the downside of the Sabo tester. It will make a hole in your fabric regardless. If our tests are marginal, meaning it's kind of close to our lower end, how are we going to make that call? Typically what we're going to do then is we're going to cut out samples and send them for testing. You've got to cut a one and a quarter to one and a half inch wide by four to six inch long sample from the exposed top surface. Again, that's typically going to be the most deteriorated surface. We're going to remove all coatings and ravel the edges to a one inch width. Here we're using a push-pull gauge and we're hanging weights from that fabric. You can look at slide 182 and we can test the fabric this way, but typically the shop's going to send this out um, to be tested professionally um, by lab <clears throat> if the results of the Sabo 
or the mall tests are marginal. And here in slide 184, we can see that. In order to test the dope, though, we have to have, or in order to test the cloth, excuse me, we have to remove the dope, right? The dope is what seals the cloth from the atmosphere. It's what we're going to apply to our airfoils when we do our fabric covering. In order to test the fabric, we need to remove the dope. So acetone, dope thinner, there's a bunch of different thinning agents to remove that uh, dope from the specimen. Slide 187, there's a couple different STC fabric covering systems. Um, again, we're using the Stewart finishing system. Seekonite Stitz and Superflight. We are using Seekonite fabric. Here, starting at one, slide 188, is a sample 337 form for fabric covering. Hint, hint, you may need this for the practical when you cover your wing and you have to ride it up. Fabric is not that difficult as compared to other things we've done related to aviation maintenance, really, but it takes practice just like anything else. There's been approved methods as time goes on that make it a lot simpler than the old-fashioned way. It just takes practice. And some people say, hey, there's no fabric airplanes left out there. Why do we have to learn this? Well, there are fabric airplanes out there, but it's a niche. But just like any niche, if you can get really good at it, you can make a good living performing it. And here are just some examples closing out the slideshow. Here's some super flight uh, finish on fabric. You can see how shiny that is. It looks really nice. Here's a PA2220. Anybody know what that is? Pacer? Not a tri-pacer, because it has conventional landing gear, right? It has a tail wheel. That is a regular pacer. 195, the world's smallest aircraft. This was designed by Ray Stitz of the Stitz STC fabric covering fame. Look at this little thing. They say it's almost impossible to control. I think it was only flown once. Has a length of 9 feet 10 inches, a 7 foot wingspan, 5 feet tall, 36 and a half square feet of wing area. And its gross weight is 666 pounds. It's powered by a Continental C85 four-stroke, 112 horsepower engine. Max speed of 220 miles per hour, no thank you. Cruise speed, 165 miles per hour, and it stalls at 60 miles per hour. You can read in slide 199, during the test flight, it only can really fly level. It is a squirrely little plane. Ray Stitz didn't even trust his own extensive flying skills to try and fly the airplane, so he hired a veteran test pilot named Bob Strar who flew the airplane. Man, I have to hand it to him, he's a brave guy. Got it over 200 miles an hour. This has been a short run through, about 50 minutes short. It's a long slideshow. Please go through the slideshow on your own. If you have questions, let me know. I will talk to you later. Best of luck. Stay safe.